coconut. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 200 officially licensed Star Trek pins with new releases every month. Stay tuned for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com just for Trek Geeks listeners. Fansets. Our pins have character. This episode is also sponsored by Science Division, the makers of the world's first interactive treble that you can control with your smartphone. Get a special discount code good for an amazing special offer later on in this episode. Find out more at sciencediv.com. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun. Hi, this is Nana Visitor, Major Kira Norris from Deep Space Nine, and you are listening to the biggest little show this side of the Gamma Quadrant, the Trek Geeks Podcast with Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. Bridge Simulator at Podfleet Command World Headquarters, located eh, somewhere, I don't know, uh, we keep moving it. We're looking for a new space, if anybody has any leads, just let us know. But it's the biggest little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant and the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Greetings, ladies, gentlemen, children of all ages, and welcome to the Trek Geeks Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bill Smith. So excited to have you here uh, as we record this in anticipation of Star Trek Day this week the 54th anniversary of this amazing franchise that we all love. And uh, here's to another year of, of great adventures and great stories and great characters. Speaking of characters, it's at this moment I'd like to introduce my podcast partner. You know, if he were sitting in the center seat of a bridge... Um, I'm pretty sure that he'd get run over by a bus because he would actually sit on a bridge and not on a starship. Yeah. He's still trying to figure it out. He's Dan Davidson. Dan, welcome aboard, buddy. It's good to have you here aboard the Podfleet Command ship. Get off the bridge. It's great to be here. I'm just over here busy doing the Janeway protocol, uh, and uh, we'll see how that all works out in my simulation later on. It's good to be here, buddy. Um, off last week, I want to take a quick moment to just uh, say thank you to the people that wished me well. Had a little bit of a health scare, but everything came back just fine. So uh, um, everything's good. Thanks for steering the ship over on lower decks for us last week. You did a great job. And uh, I don't like taking a week off. I really don't. It's not fun. Wait, so I just want to get this straight on Trek Geeks. You thank me for steering the ship. On Discovering yeah. Trek, you say, thank God I'm back so Bill doesn't have to steer the ship. Because Absolutely. Because it was terrible. Because yeah. that's a comedy show over there. Is that what it's that is? It's a comedy is? show over here, too. So, yeah, you saw yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. There you go. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, before we get into contact information, we want to make a programming note. And that is starting this week, we're actually going to break news out into its own separate sub show in the Trek Geeks feed. So what that will mean, listeners, is if you subscribe to the Trek Geeks podcast, you will get not one, but two episodes the regular Trek Geeks podcast, and then the news from Trek News uh, later on in the week. So I um, had a lot of feedback from people over the years that uh, it takes us too long to get to the main body of content, and we still like talking about the news. So that's why we're kind of spin it off into its own show, Dan. Yeah, I think it's actually a fantastic idea. Uh, like you said, we've been getting feedback for, for a while with things like this, and we actually got some really wonderful um, praise and feedback from one of our listeners, uh, Greg, last week. And one of the things that he did bring up, as well as others have brought up, is it takes too long to get to the meat of our conversation, like you said, Bill. So I think it's a fantastic idea that we're doing this. I know our friends over at treknews.net are going to be very excited that we'll have a special segment just for them, just just hosted by them, so to speak, uh, 
uh, every week. We'll have our our patented uh, musical intro, I'm sure, and you're going to do your amazing voice work at the beginning before we do new, new stories for the week. So I think it's great. Um, and the cool thing is, is people that subscribe to the Trek Geeks podcast don't have to do a thing. It's automatically going to come down in their feed because you, Bill, are a computer genius. Gee, no, what do you need? I, what do I you need? need? I'm, just, I'm just happy to be here. Actually, yeah. can, can you do me a favor? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, uh, can you do me a favor mm. and tell the folks at home how they can get in touch with us like uh, Greg did last week? Absolutely. I'd, I'd be happy to do that. If you're looking to get in touch with us like Greg, you can head on over to trekgeeks.com slash contact, and there you'll find a multitude of ways to communicate with us. There's Skype chat. There's email. There's even voicemail by way of that big blue button using SpeakPipe. Whatever way you want to contact us, just make it so... We love hearing from you. Plus, there's also the most positive Star Trek group on Facebook. It's called Camp Kittimer. It's our official group, and it's where over 1,700 other friends gather to talk Trek. It's always positive, and we never allow bashing or gatekeeping. We will shut that bleep down. That's what I'm saying. Yes. So to join the group, head on over to facebook.com slash groups slash Camp Kittimer and be ready to take part in a truly wonderful social experience. And as always, we want to thank our wonderful admins, Haley, Jackie, and Dan, for the amazing job they do running the camp. But Bill, I want you to remember that any comments or messages you leave us in any of these places may be used in a future episode. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you, Arnold. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, Stay here. I'll be back. Dan, this is a very special week for Star Trek fans. As this episode is dropping, we've just had Star Trek Day, and that's exciting. I mean, if you remember, our friends at Fansets delayed their Star Trek releases for the beginning of the month just for this very special occasion. Yeah, and and what a special occasion it is, my friend. 54 years ago this week, Star Trek premiered and the world would never be the same again. And to commemorate this very special day, our good friends at Fansets have an amazing list of products that are available right now at Fansets.com. Lower Decks has been a huge hit, and you know that Fansets would be proudly representing this new show. So get your crew pins added to your collection this very moment. Go right, pause us, go out to Fansets.com and order Mariner, Boimler, Tendi, Rutherford, Rutherford? Rutherford. (laughs) (laughs) You from Massachusetts? (laughs) Captain Freeman, First Officer Ransom, Security Chief Shax, and Dr. Ta'ana. They are all available right now. Each pin is available for $6.95 each, or you can get the whole set of eight for only $49.95. And that's not all, folks. No sorry, because coming up on the 15th of this month, Soji from Star Trek Picard will be making her debut. And are you ready for the next full-size Delta there, Bill? I know I you am. are. I'm you ready. Just, you just had one on a minute ago. I did. Um, I, I hope you're ready because the com badge from All Good Things, oh. the Star Trek Next Generation finale, uh, will be available on September 15th. And just as a little teaser, I'm going to throw one more out there for you. Oh, okay. Yeah, do it. In October, you can look forward to the Section 31 Delta. <laughs> <laughs> How do you really feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> that is great news for the month of September. But Dan, we're not done yet. Oh boy. Yeah, you thought we were. I we are not, my friend. Wow. We are not. We are proud to announce that fansets will be starting the production of magnetic backed Starfleet Deltas, and first up will be the immensely popular Star Trek Picard Delta. This magnetic back Delta will be available sometime before the end of the year, and we're going to keep you updated on specific dates as they're made available. But until then, go to fansets.com. When you get there, put a whole lot of pins and accessories and even gift certificates into your cart, because when you spend more than 30 bucks, you're automatically going to get free shipping in the US. And then on top of that, for 15% off your entire order, 15% 15% use the special Trek Geeks discount code for this week, CAPTAINS. That's CAPTAINS in all capital letters, C-A-P-T-A-I-N-S, all caps. This discount code will be available to use now until Wednesday, September 16th, 2020 at midnight Eastern Daylight Time. Fansets, our pins have character. 
And we thank our friends at Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of Trek Geeks. Dan. Hi, Bill. As you know, it's the 54th anniversary week of Star Trek, the original series, which premiered back in 1966. What? Yeah. Yeah. We had this whole day called Star Trek Day. Maybe you've heard of it. That was today? Uh, as we record. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we have our uh, pretty much our entire lives, because we're yeah. almost as old as Star Trek is. Mm-hmm. We have been treated to adventures and stories and and just this ser- a series of of different shows that have embraced the human spirit that have been a mirror for humanity and have inspired generations of people along the way fair statement very fair very accurate and and when you say inspired generations you are absolutely 100% correct that's one of the things i love most about star trek is is that it does inspire people. It inspired me. I know it inspired you. Mm-hmm. And it's inspired millions of people for 54 years. That's unbelievable. It really is. And if you think about it, at the center of most of these series, because it's not true in every case now, mm-hmm. but at the center of most of these series has been a character that has been in command of the the crew and the ship in question or the space station. And that's what we're going to talk about this week. We're going to talk about the captains of Star Trek and how... Um, how they relate to the Star Trek universe and and how they've inspired uh, over the years. And that's going to be our, our conversation this week. Um, there are a lot of captains. Yeah, I was just going to say that. A okay. uh, whole lot. Off the top of your head, do you have an all-time favorite? Well, we've talked about this a lot. And I got to say, it, it goes, I go back and forth between two because one has been my favorite captain for so long and one hasn't. It's only been favorite for a very short amount of time. Yeah, Ben Cisco, he's he's just he just is is the captain that I've always looked up to the most. Um, ever since uh, ever, ever since Deep Space Nine was on the air, I think Avery Brooks did just such a fantastic job with with the character, with the story, with the history. But Anson Mount as Captain Pike is just is just one that you can look at and say that is the definition the definition of courage. That is a definition of what a Starfleet officer is supposed to be. Um, so I would have to say I'm in a dead heat statistical tie with Captain Sisko and Captain Pipe, Pike played by Anson Mount. I, I can respect that because that's been my answer for a while. You know, growing up, my boyhood hero was Captain James T. Kirk, and mm-hmm. rightfully so because it was the only Star Trek on at the time. True. And uh, over time, I, I, I like you, I identified with Sisko. I... I Respected the hell out of Ben Cisco, even though he poisoned a planet. And <laughs> well, let's be honest. Uh, uh, you know, well, things happen. Everybody uh, has a bad day. Bill. Everybody's got a bad day. But I have to, I have to say that Captain Pike has probably become my favorite captain. I'm going to caveat that by saying, regardless of whom it's played by. Mm, I love caviar. I, I hate you so much right now. <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, Anson Mount has certainly oh. added so much more depth to Captain Pike and, yes. and the writers, mm-hmm. you know, the, the people who, who wrote season two of Star Trek Discovery and who will be writing Strange New Worlds um, have, have really gone out of their way to help flesh out this character. But it had to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where Star Trek starts. You know, there was this uh, there was a post in Camp Kittimer earlier today about the cage and how great it was. And someone who's going to celebrate Star Trek Day by watching the cage. And if you think about it. The cage really didn't become watchable yeah. until the late 1980s. That's um, right. We hadn't seen it until then. At that point, it was considered lost footage. Yeah. And it was black and white and spliced together with the scenes from the menagerie. And those were the only parts in color. Mm-hmm. That was most Star Trek fans, at least of our age, their That's first right. exposure to the cage. And it all starts with Chris Pike. And at that point, he is he's broken. He's beaten. He's weary. Um, he's not sure he wants to be doing this anymore. He almost wants to start his own you know, pleasure planet or whatever. And that's kind of where we get introduced to this character. And we get taken on a journey with Chris Pike there and also later on in the JJ films and now in Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And we've learned that Chris Pike is a really complex guy who really embodies what Starfleet is. He really does. And, and, and you're right. When you think about it, if if Gene had his way, 
this is who we were going to see in Star Trek. Yeah. That was going to be the guy. And it was the network that said, no, we need, we want something different. But that was his idea for what Star Trek was going to be like with this captain who, like you said, was tired. Uh, he's lost too many people under his command. And he just wants to, to go somewhere and, and forget about all that. He's got huge weight on his shoulders. And we do see that uh, the, the portrayal that Jeff Hunter does in that in, in, in the cage and the menagerie is, is certainly one that is uh, memorable. But then we get to see it built upon with what with what Anson brings to the character, and you find out just how upset he was that they were not be that they were not involved in the war with the Klingons. Yeah, they were out on the on the edge of, of frontier space and or however you want to call it, and and that was something that he really had a problem with, and it was like he he let himself and Starfleet down by being forced to stay away. And I think that that continuation of the story that we saw in season two and that we're going to see in, in strange new world worlds is one that I'm really looking forward to because let's face it, we know he's only got a finite amount of time left before the accident. That's it. This, yeah, you, you're, you're hitting right where I was going to go. Yeah. And so even knowing what he knows, I have no doubt he's still going to be the captain that we've seen from the cage and all through Discovery Season 2. He has to be. Yeah. And there's no other choice because that's who Chris Pike is. You know, it's funny because Anson Mount on the, the Strange New Worlds panel today uh, during Star Trek Day talked about how, you know, at some point he's going to receive a promotion to, to fleet captain. Right. And at that point, he knows that his fate, you know, is, is, is there. Mm-hmm. It's not long. Yeah. So the only question is, when does that happen? It's like, well, he can't try to not get a promotion yep. Yep. because it's going to happen. It's been He's sealed. Seen it. He's, his fate has been sealed, as we saw in Discovery Season 2. Now, I think we did some math, and I think from the time of, of Discovery Season 2 to the accident is about, ten, it's about 10 years. So I think he's got about 10 years to play with. Roughly. Um, so that's not a lot of time when you think of it. Uh, especially when you know what's coming. And we may get into this later on, but I'm going to say it now because we're talking about Pike right now. In terms of what, you know, we, we nickname our episodes when we put them together, and this episode is Captain's Courageous. Hmm. I don't think there is a more courageous moment by any of the captains in any of Star Trek history than what Captain Pike did in Discovery Season 2. He knew what was going to happen to him if he took that time crystal, and he knew that he had to do it, and he did it, knowing what he was going to become. That's the ultimate definition of courage. Well, and and the ultimate sacrifice in a sense, mm-hmm. because he's essentially uh, he's he's creating a reverse mortgage on his life. Yeah, you know and he's he's taking the payment up front for what he's going to have to pay out later. And the interesting thing about that, which I don't know if we ever really talked about it on Discovering Trek, is he did this knowing what was going to happen, not knowing if he took the crystal was going to save everybody. It was a gamble. Yeah, it was a gamble. And so he still did it because he knew that he had to. So. That's that's courage right there, my friend. You know, it's it's a character whose fate, you know, must weigh on him every single day. Because I I, I don't know about you, but if I received that particular um, vision of the future, yeah. that would be all I thought about. Yeah. Is it today? Yep. Is today the day I get promoted? Hey, Chris, congratulations! Your fleet captain. Oh. Oh, we want you to go help the help some people uh, help some cadets on this J class starship. Oh. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's going to make Strange New Worlds very interesting. Although I, we can't talk about Chris Pike and not mention Bruce Greenwood. Oh, absolutely. Because Bruce Greenwood brought kind of this elder statesman Pike, this instructor Pike, this father figure Pike to Jim Kirk's life in the Kelvin timeline. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a, a fantastic portrayal. It's, he still is the same character with that same sense of duty and Starfleet and honor, but still very different for the Kelvin timeline. And it works amazingly well. It really does. And it's interesting. I actually watched Into Darkness uh, a few nights ago. I just happened to be sitting on the couch and I wanted to have something on in the background while I was doing my stuff. And so I put that on and I, I was teared up. I teared up. What, it was, I was so upset that they killed him off when they did in the Kelvin timeline. Now... You know, we saw him in the wheelchair at the end of the 2009 movie, and it was kind of a nice tie-in, but not really, even though he had the Kirk Admiral uniform from the motion picture kind of on. But 
it, it, uh, we talk about we've talked today about things that have been unexpected. This was unexpected. I did not expect Captain Pike to die in the darkness. Um, and it was tough. It was a tough scene. Bruce does a great job with the character, and and they had that relationship. Uh, Kirk and and Pike had that relationship that was very special, and you saw the pain on Kirk's face when he died. He really embodied courage, also uh, in the Kelvin timeline. So, got to give you know Captain Pike, no matter what universe he's in, seems to be pretty damn cool. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, now the interesting thing is that you know, of course, NBC decides they don't like Star Trek. They send Gene back to do a second pilot, unheard of at the time. And so he comes back. Jeff Hunter's no longer available. Um, so he rewrites the the part as Captain James T. Kirk. And they go through a, a series of actors and finally settle on William Shatner. But James, it's interesting to think about this. And I, I didn't think about this until recently that essentially the genesis of who Jim Kirk is is born out of Chris Pike. Yeah. Um, you know, we always think of Captain Kirk as, as this legendary, iconic figure in American pop culture and world pop culture, honestly. Mm -hmm. And who Kirk is at his core is very much the guts of who Chris Pike is. Yeah, I think in some aspects it was the um, writing that was thrown on the floor, possibly, as well as parts that we saw of Jeff Hunter's Pike all meshed together to yeah. make Kirk. And one of the things that I've always found interesting about Kirk is that, you know, you just said it. He's just, you know, he's known throughout the world as this hero and but he had a, he had he had issues when, you know, we we the, the uh, episode obsessed where we know that he went through some traumatic times when he was a lieutenant uh with Gar Captain Garavik and and stuff Oh yeah, like obsession. That. Yep. So yep. um so he's had to go through some uh, courageous times himself, but it, it's weird as I was going through the list of characters in my head before we recorded, courage wasn't isn't the first word that comes to mind when it comes to Kirk. No, it's me. not. It really isn't. Even what though is he it? went on the away, I'm not sure. Even though he went on the away missions, which of course Picard didn't do because they didn't allow it by then. Um, I don't know. Maybe uh, I don't, it's kind of a trope, but a swashbuckler. I don't know if that works. I don't want to say ladies' man because it's not what Kirk was supposed to be about, and he kind of only did that in in the third season. I don't know. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna use gallant. Okay. Um, heroic. Yeah. Brave. And Kirk is very much the hero's captain, you know, whereas, you know, I'm sure that that was always the vision for the lead of the series, because at that time, William Shatner was the star of Star Trek. Right. It was not an ensemble cast. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, when I think of Kirk, I, you mentioned swashbuckling. I think of that. I think of that, you know, Horatio Hornblower sense for this, yeah. this gallant hero who, who always saves the day or always comes up with the right solution. He's very brave. I mean, you can, uh, you, you can't say Jim Kirk is not brave. He absolutely oh, no, is. absolutely not. And, it, and there can be very vast distinction between bravery and courage. Other definitions of gallant, and this also fits with Kirk. Oh. Uh, as a noun, a man who pays special attention to women. <laughs> as a verb, uh, a flirt with women. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so uh, in all three senses of the word, adjective, noun, and <laughs> verb, it does kind of fit J James T. Kirk to a it, T. It really does. It's it's funny. This this may be the wrong way to, to, to think of it, but if you were to say what's the first image that you think of when someone says Jim Kirk, you know what? Unfortunately, the first image that always pops in, do you, think, do you know what I'm going to say? I don't, but you want me to tell you what I, I'm thinking first? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to think the two-foot drop kick holding on to baskets. <laughs> In the Let's, Omega Glory. Okay. Well, you know what I think of, which is, I really don't think it's the right way to look at it, but it just pops into my head, is him putting his boots on in wink of an eye after he <laughs> supposedly had been with, uh, I think it was Dila. Yeah. I don't yeah, know yeah. why that's the first thing I pop, when I think swashbuckler, for some reason, I think of those boots, which makes me think of him putting on his boots. That or I was going to think <laughs> of him throwing his ass at the Endorian in Journey to Babel. <laughs> yeah. I'm in deck, deck five. Deck five. Dorian. <laughs> Security. <laughs> <laughs> Captain? Captain Kirk? <laughs> Say, yeah, don't send help. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yep. You know, but but James T. Kirk embodies that that gallantry. He embodies that embodies that hero quality that that inspired me as a child. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I think of my favorite TV characters in those years, and it was Batman, and it was Colonel Steve Austin, the six million dollar man, and it was mm -hmm. Captain James T. Kirk. All three of them very heroic 
Yes. Um, those seem to be the roles that were largely cut out in those days. These days we have more anti-heroes. We have more morally ambiguous characters. Mm. But, you know, if you think of, you know, a hero among heroes, James T. Kirk really is is setting the bar pretty high. I think maybe that's why he stands out because it wasn't something that we saw as much of back then. Uh, or like, since. Cause, cause, or since, because when you talk about it, I'm like, yep, definitely Colonel Austin, Captain Kirk. Okay. I'm I'm not really thinking much else. Of course, Batman, but but uh, yeah, it's just really a Beretta. Uh, I mean, it's, it's I don't even know where that came from, but Beretta. But, <laughs> that's, that's what I mean. See, Fish. you're drinking a White Claw, aren't you? <laughs> so maybe that's why he stands out as much as he does, because there was no other roles to stand out. And this is not to slight any other characters Absolutely on any other not. series. No. I mean, because Leonard Nimoy as Spock is the heart and soul of Star Trek, and we've said that many times. Mm-hmm. But this purely is an examination of Star Trek's captains. Kirk stands out because he is the guy who saves the day, whether with words or with his fists or in some cases with his two feet <laughs> doing a drop kick. Um, Captain Kirk always gets it done. He tries to represent humanity as best he can. He tries to explain to people that, you know, we're humans, we have a lot to learn, but um, we mean you no harm after I try to punch you. His bravery stands out with the fact that sometimes he had Brett Favre disease where he would shoot from the hip a little too fast. Yep. Yep. And whether that was good or bad, it all depends on the eye of the beholder, I guess. But um, it's something that was always there with him. I will always have a deep and abiding love for Captain Kirk mm-hmm. uh, as a character. I, yeah. you know, I he he was my first starship captain. Um, it's weird to to think he's not my favorite anymore. Yeah. Um, but I mean, isn't it, that what's great about Star Trek? As we celebrate fifty four years, that it's not just a couple captains anymore. There's like a dozen. <laughs> it's it's really not. And in fact, going back to my my favorite captains, I never finished my thought because ah. um, I got sidetracked, and you know, I got that old happens. man brain. Um, <laughs> I think that Janeway has surpassed Cisco for me. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I love Ben Cisco. Love, we both love Voyager now. Um, but the humanity that Captain Janeway displays and and her uh, the way she considers problems and solutions really speaks to me as an as an adult male. Um, I think differently than it would have twenty five years ago. Yeah. I think that's why I respect her so much more now. So we'll talk more about Janeway in a bit. So, Bill, like all of us, Science Division is celebrating Star Trek Day, and that means you can get their amazing interactive Tribble and something extra. You know, this is a great deal, too. I mean, right now through Friday, September 11th, 2020, if you adopt a Science Division Tribble, they'll send you not only your brand new interactive friend from the future, but also the little golden book, Too Many Tribbles, and a Star Trek sticker. And this is just really amazing. I love that book. Plus, if you order two or more Tribbles, you're going to get $10 off your adoption. That, I, I can't. I want to read that book. Uh, it's a great starter kit for anyone looking to celebrate the anniversary of Star Trek by assimilating their kids into the fandom. Plus, for adults, it's a nod to a classic episode of the original series that we have just cherished for decades. Five decades when you think about it. Oh, man. I, I know, really? And, and don't forget, the interactive Tribble from Science Division doesn't just look good sitting on your shelf. Remember, they have three modes. At ease, where they're happy and content. On Duty, which is a random mix of happy and angry sounds, and Watchdog, where you can be sure that Klingon agents are close by. And you don't have to use the app to enjoy a Tribble, and that's largely, Bill, because, you know, Tribbles are not dangerous. No, but they are app-enabled, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. You can buy your Tribble right now at sciencediv.com, and when it arrives, you can download the Section K7 app on your iOS or Android device, give it a name, and even choose what ship you want it to be assigned to. So take advantage of the special sale at Science Division. Be sure to enter the special code Star Trek. That's Star Trek in all capital letters with no spaces. This code is good to use until Friday, September 11th, 2020 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun. And we thank our friends at Science Division for sponsoring this week's episode. I want to move along to uh, the next captain in series order, mm-hmm. which would be uh, the the incredible Jean-Luc Picard, uh, captain of the USS Enterprise-D. I think that looking back at it now, 
Um, I don't think in 1987 we thought we would have been talking about this character in such glowing terms. Um, after Encounter at Farpoint. Not, not after season one. <laughs> yeah. Period. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, there's something in, in uh, Skin of Evil and Tasha Yar's funeral scene. Just on last night. At the top of the hill um, in the holodeck. You know, she uh, goes through talking about the rest of the, the crew. And she comes to Picard and she says that he has the heart of an explorer and the soul of a poet. And that's always struck me about Picard, even back then. Mm-hmm. Because here is this captain who is no less brave, no less gallant, no less the epitome of Starfleet. But at his core, he's very, very different. Oh, 100% different. I don't, this, this, I don't mean this to sound negative in any way, but when I think of courageous captains, I don't think of Picard right away at all. I think of Picard as the diplomatic captain, as the suave captain, as the debonair captain, as the one who will work through negotiations. There's not a lot that really comes to mind with me about specific acts of courage. Sure, he has them. Every captain does. But I think the character of Picard is so different than that of what we were used to with Kirk that it's just one that never would – would he would never be up on that list for me for, quote, courageous captains. And like I said, that's not a negative thing in any way, shape, or form. Now, has your view changed since then? With Picard season one? Well, with Picard in general, we've got 30 plus years of Jean-Luc Picard in our lives. I don't know if I've given it enough thought to to wonder if it's changed. And all of the iterations we've seen with Picard through all seven seasons and through all the movies and now through Star Trek Picard season one, my appreciation and respect for the way the character has been through those 30 plus years hasn't changed. So I don't know if my definition of whether I would consider him courageous or not has changed either. I think my definition has, because I think I agreed with you for the first several seasons of Next Gen. Seasons one and two kind of meh. Season three, it really started to find its its own self. But after his encounter with the Borg, hmm. I think it it changed him, you know, immeasurably to the point where his courage was more internal. It may not have been, hey, let's go grab the phaser and defend the ship or let's yeah. go get the girl. Um, his his courage was more thoughtful. I can appreciate that, especially now when you bring it up. As soon as you said season three, I said, oh, we're going to talk about the Borg in a second. And you're right. What's more courageous than than taking over the fleet in Star Trek First Contact and going to fight those who assimilated him? You didn't really see that. You saw the you saw the fear when he was uh, going to be dealing with Hugh uh, in I Borg. You definitely saw the fear in Picard. Of course, he's much older um, and being on that cube and being on a cube for the first time since he was assimilated. But he did show some pretty strong, uh, courageous moments uh, in First Contact. Uh, it seems to center around the Borg a lot too, though. Well, it does, but let's talk about what I think is one of his most courageous moments, and that is laying himself bare emotionally to his brother, brother. Maurice, in the vineyard uh, at, at Labar. He's broken. He's battered. He's, he's a shell of a man. And he says, you know, they took everything I was, and there was nothing he could do to stop it. And that, for me, is one of his most courageous moments because a starship captain is is impenetrable. I mean, you know, they're, they're Teflon. Yeah. They don't have those moments. And Picard showed that he was, at the end of everything else, a human, a human affected by things. And I think that that demonstrates more courage than a lot of people realize. Yeah, I, I absolutely uh, agree with you. Did you say Maurice? I think you meant Robert. I did. Th- that's okay. I, I did. That's I, right. I, I meant Robert and I said Maurice. Because then I'm like, wait a minute. Maurice uh, is his father. Yeah, I'm like, oh, wait, yeah. now I'm now I'm now I'm guess see, make me second guess myself, Bill, which means you're very good at manipulation, <laughs> <laughs> like a captain. But you're absolutely right. Um, he, captains don't do what he did. You don't see captains. They may do it, but you don't see it. We saw it We're right there in front of in front of our eyes, and I don't think his brother expected it either. And I'll tell you what, if you haven't read the autobiography of Jean Luc Picard. You definitely want to read it because there are some moments in that too that really highlight what this character is all about. I think in many ways, Jean-Luc Picard is as inspiring as Chris Pike. Um, certainly in their duty to Starfleet, but in about being better and in about you know doing the right thing uh, as far as 
um, evolved human sensibility. We, they don't always get it right. They don't always, you know, do the right thing. They do make mistakes, but I think they both demonstrate this this aspirational quality that I don't think Jim Kirk necessarily did all the time. And that's just me. That, that's my own, you know, perception. That's my own two cents. But when I think of captains who inspire me to, to be better, to do better, I put Jean-Luc Picard on that list personally. I would agree with you there, definitely. It's, it's one of those, uh, well, you just said a moment ago, Tasha, uh, or, or Tasha said it um, during her little uh, hologram. It's like a father figure, even though she didn't know what a father was like. Yeah. Somebody to look up to, someone to to be able to trust, to, to guide them in the right way. So yeah, I definitely can agree with what you're saying there, man. And honestly, I didn't realize how much I had come to value Jean-Luc Picard until Star Trek Picard season one. You know, it's like we, in our conversation with Jonathan Frakes uh, a a few months ago, you know, I said, you know, these were not the characters that I grew up with. TNG wasn't my Trek. It premiered on my 18th birthday. Yeah. It was the first new Trek of my adult life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't realize how these characters had become so important to me. And I didn't realize that Picard himself had become that important to me. And I think that's, I think that's pretty awesome that I can still get these kinds of lessons from, from Star Trek. And I think that um, every, um, Every person who loves this this franchise as much as we do and the age brackets have that with each captain. I'm sure that there yeah. are people that feel that way about Cisco, about Archer, about Janeway, everybody. And I think that's one of the things that makes Star Trek so special, especially uh, to people that need it in their lives like we both have had. Absolutely. So the next captain in series order is, of course, Benjamin Lafayette Cisco. And I just love saying his full name because it just flows. <laughs> Cisco is – that's interesting because Emissary was on the uh, the Star Trek Day stream today and I, I had it on while I was working. And I think the reason I was drawn to Cisco so much initially is because at the, he's broken at the beginning. Right. You know, he is a guy who has lost everything except his son. And he's not so sure he wants to do this anymore, much like Chris Pike. But he's angry. He's angry, but the, he is a, is a great example of courage because, yeah – you, this is the first time that we've seen a captain who had a family. We hadn't seen that with series yeah. regulars before. This was the first time. She's dead. Jennifer's gone. He's left with this young son, and he doesn't know what to do. And you're right. He is angry. But he he builds up that courage to do what his assignment uh, is, uh, to do the assignment that's given. And it turns out to be the best decision he ever made in his career and as a father, I think. And that's the definition of courage is standing up for things that you might be afraid of doing and doing it and doing it successfully. And Cisco, Benjamin Lafayette, Cisco did it very, very well. He really did. I mean, you think of the the arc of growth that he goes on from seasons one through seven. And it's it's a roller coaster. It really is. I mean, he starts off this this very angry commander and winds up this this very gallant and and self-sacrificing captain. Mm -hmm. And. It's, it's interesting because as I was watching Emissary today, I think there's four particular words in that pilot that have affected me and that I've carried with me through the years. And it's the scene, uh, you know, toward the end where he keeps asking the, the wormhole aliens, mm-hmm. using air quotes, why do you keep bringing me here? And the response that, that, that the aliens give is because you exist here. I've thought about those four words uh, more times than I can count um, over the years of my adult life. You know, uh, it's very easy as humans to get bogged down in the things that 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 affect us, that depress us, that that cause us some emotional pain or, or sorrow. And it's one thing to experience it and to process that grief and move on. It's another thing to exist in that moment perpetually. And that was something that I had to think about a lot, especially after my mom died. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's one thing to learn to live with what's occurred or to, to learn how to accept what's occurred because that's really what it's about. It's another thing to keep existing in that moment. And that's really what's causing Cisco most of his pain at that point. He exists there. He will not grow past that moment unless he lets it go. And then he builds the courage to let it go. He does. And we see what happens through the rest of his journey until he joins the prophets. Uh, yeah, I, I've always I've always really appreciated what Avery brought to the role. Um, and, and his courage wasn't something that he wore on his sleeve. 
Um, I think that um, just in the way that he commanded the people uh, on, uh, of the crew and the way that the relationship with the son, to be able to have that, you could see that difference in the way that he was with his son and the way he was with his crew. But then he was also with his crew certain ways when it wasn't, you know, in ops or whatnot. He had those special relationships. But you're absolutely right, man. As soon as he decided to no longer exist in that moment, that's when it really kicked in. And it was all because of the courage that he built up to do it. It's interesting to me that a lot of these examinations that we've talked about deal with the courage of the human spirit and not the courage of their actions in their various missions and uh, their boldly going. Right. Which has, which is really just speaks to the heart of Star Trek. Well, when you're going to poison a planet, you really can't, you know, <laughs> go with that for courage because that's kind of not right. <laughs> well, the the other thing that's incredibly courageous about Cisco is you know you talked about his relationships. He he very courageously wears his love for his son on his sleeve. Yeah, we've talked about that many times, and it's for me it's Star Trek's greatest love story. And we've talked about that uh, in the past, but mm-hmm. that's. That's a rather conscious and courageous decision to make. He's not a captain that boxes himself out from the rest of his crew, from his senior staff. He's not one who keeps his emotions internalized like Picard. Right. He has that love for Jake right out there. And it's he's like, look, this is who I am. I'm a father. I'm a Starfleet officer in that order. Right. And I think that's one of the most beautiful parts of Ben Sisko. Yeah. One of the things you see most with that is when Jake decides to stay on the, the station after the uh, Dominion takes it over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's not happy. But at the same time, he knows his son's uh, old enough to make his own decisions. He's an adult and dumb kid. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> May as well just call him Dan. Um, well, wow. Wow. Of course, you're not a kid anymore, buddy. And I don't wear sofa upholstery either. Uh, don't you, though? No. Well, I used to. Yeah, you used to. It was the 90s, so a lot happened. <laughs> I think I did, too. I called them vests back yes. then. Yeah. yeah. Chess king. Oh, my God. <laughs> so Hashtag well. chess king. <laughs> um, moving along in our captains, in uh, in series order, we, we come to uh, the, the the captain I, I lovingly refer to as Katie J, mm-hmm. and that is Captain Catherine Janeway, Federation Starship Voyager. My... My love for this character really has grown immeasurably. Um, uh, not only does she have some of the more courageous moments of, of some of our gallant captains, even just in the action sense, because let's face it, Janeway gets to be a bit of an action hero multiple times throughout Star oh, yeah. Trek Voyager. But she makes some incredibly courageous decisions along the way. And I think that's why I respect Janeway so much. She doesn't just sort of say, well, we're going to do this. She has a very reasoned process and she makes the choice. And once she commits to it, she's done. There's no discussion. Chakotay could try to mumble to her all he wants. <laughs> it's not happening. Um, and and she doesn't she doesn't waver. And I really respect that about her. As I have gotten older, that's a quality I I I wish I possessed, quite frankly. And and let's be let's be honest, let's be frank. It starts in the first episode. She yeah. made that decision, and she's going for it all out. I mean, she put all the cards on the table, and that's that's the way it was going to be. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, and, I, and I've said it a thousand times, and I will say it a thousand more times. Thank God for Heroes and Icons, H&I Television, so I could start do that rewatch a few years back because, like you, the respect that I have for Voyager, for the entire crew, but especially Catherine, as I like to call her, is um, – is just off the charts. I, she's probably, uh, because I've talked about Cisco and, and Pike, she's number two or three, depending on if it's one, one A. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. And she's, and, and you got to give all the credit in the world to Kate because of what she brought to that character. Absolutely. Is H and I paying you under the table? And I just don't no, know. But it? I, I really wish they, I really, I'll tell you what, I wish they had it here at Merrimack because I'd be watching it still. Even though, isn't that weird that we have it on Netflix? We have it on CBS All Access. We have all the DVDs, but something special about watching it on a real TV station. Like when it's on BBC America, I'm like, oh my God, Deep Space Nine is on. Yeah, but I can't stand <laughs> the BBC America cuts because they shorten the out. episodes yeah. and they add commercials. Yeah. Kind of like TOS in the 70s. I don't think H&I does that. So. Uh, see, I would rather watch it without commercials. I know. I don't know. So I just gonna say I dial up the the Netflix or the CBS All Access or my home media server because it yeah. seems like I have a copy of Star Trek freaking everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> Not a but, bad thing. 
No. But you know, you're right. It does start with Janeway from episode one and continues the whole way. There are times where she doubts herself. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's only normal. It's part of the human condition. There are times where she locks herself away from the crew. Right. Because uh, of her own, uh, her own guilt, her own doubt. depression, her own doubt. And that's a very courageous move to admit that those things are occurring. Yeah. You know, it's, I keep coming back to the more human courageous moments, but she has some of the most courageous moments in all of Star Trek. Well, she has to show at all times that she is the captain and she's the one responsible for every life on the ship. But you're right. The courage to tell everybody that she's not in a good place. She needs to go run off and and, and hide in her quarters for a little while and, and get everything straightened out. That's courage because you don't expect your captain to do that. And you have to wonder after the fact if they're going to think differently of you because of that. But she doesn't, she doesn't let that bother her. You want to talk about courage? The woman comes back from the future to her younger self and says, hey, <laughs> here's how you kick the Borg's ass. <laughs> That's courage, man. Mm-hmm. Yep. I um, No, I, I have grown to love that character um, more than I thought possible. I can't imagine a world of Star Trek without Catherine Janeway. I used to think that, you know, I used to make the joke that Janeway was the worst captain in Starfleet because she got the ship lost on day one. And I... I mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Uh, that's because I didn't know enough about Janeway and I hadn't sat my butt down to watch all of it. I'll tell you what, I used to think negatively towards her because she got promoted to Admiral and Picard was still in command of the Enterprise. It's like, what did you get? What did you do to become Admiral? You stranded everybody and then you got them home barely because of some steel encased tunnels in subspace. Well, remember, <laughs> Kirk <laughs> told Picard, don't accept promotion. So he probably just didn't. Well, still, but that's what I used to, I used to think that I don't think that anymore. No, I, I think that, <laughs> I think that Janeway has become one of Starfleet's greatest captains Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll die on that hill. I really I will. I ho- and I got to say, man, I hope we see her again. Oh, I, I hope so too. too. Oh, I really do. I hope so. I would love to see Kate Mulgrew in that role again. Yep, I think so it would be I. amazing. Yeah. It's, it's funny because a little bit of a tangent, you know, we've seen, you know, we saw Shatner as, you know, TJ Hooker and all the things that he's done. And, and we've seen, um, uh, Patrick Stewart and things. And I, I'm sorry, as, as much as, as the, as the role in Orange is the New Black was great for her, I can't see her as anything else but Catherine. And I don't want that to be negative because it's such a great role, but that actors are always afraid of being typecast and never get a role outside of what they became famous for. But in some ways, all the great things that Kate's done, I don't, I don't want her to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do. I, I think. That, I mean, I do, but I mean, I say that tongue in cheek. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Get over it. I'm sorry. Um, in series order next, we have to talk about really what amounts to the first captain. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Archer. And yeah, uh, people go, well, it was retcon. It was a prequel. It doesn't so, matter. He's the first captain. Yep. And I, I think that makes him immeasurably important through all of Starfleet because for many captains who would come after, he was the blueprint. Mm-hmm. He was the first to head out that way. Yeah. And uh, talk about courage. Talk about going into the unknown with no idea of what to expect because the Vulcans sure weren't giving him any heads up on what to expect. Um, he was he was a man alone in more ways than ro- and one. Um, but uh, he still handled it uh, like a captain. I guess it's the best way to put it. Yeah, that's that's really great. Thanks for that insight. Welcome. That's uh, easy to see why Trek Geeks is not the official Star Trek podcast. <laughs> 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 no, but but Archer uh, Archer is uh, he's rough around the edges in some areas and just still incredibly polished in others. Mm-hmm. You know, he is learning along the way just like everybody else and I think that's what makes Archer really a fascinating character to me because he makes mistakes. The entire crew makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is you've got to learn from something. You know, you can't just wait until you have all the knowledge. At some point, you have to go out and experience it and and do it. And that's what Jonathan Archer winds up getting to do. I think that, you know, if I try to think of a word that I would associate to Jonathan Archer, I think it would be trailblazer. You know, um, because... You know, the, the pioneers take the arrows, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he was the guy who, who went out first. He was the guy who inevitably got called back to Earth when there was an attack yep. on Earth from the Zindi. He was the guy who had to try to stop, you know, the uh, the annihilation of, of the human race. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, he's the guy who had to fight the temporal Cold War. Right. He had a lot of things that, that thrown onto his plate, and he just thought he was going to go out and see the, the galaxy and meet all kinds of aliens. And on top of that, one of the things that I already pre- always appreciated about Archer is he had his grudges, man. He did not like Vulcans because of the, he felt that they yeah. held his dad back, um, and he was not happy. And then you see that in the first few episodes. It's not the whole first season about the way he feels about Vulcans, the way he treats to Paul. But as every good captain does, he knows that he's going to grow from the experiences, and he certainly does to the point where I think the bond between – uh, especially he and T'Pol is, is, is very evident and not, none more so than in Twilight. Uh, oh, absolutely. A fantastic episode with, with Archer and what he has to deal with just in that episode. You could, we could do a whole show on, on courage with captains, but yeah, absolutely. Archer's, he, he was the first and, um, he had to, he had the least knowledge of what to deal with, but he went out there, you know, riding that horse. The thing that makes the difference <laughs> riding that horse. No, that was that's Pike. Right. Oh, that's um, right. The the thing that makes the difference for Archer with me is that I can see the other captains in Star Trek asking themselves, what would Jonathan Archer have done? Yeah. Because, you know, here they are in this situation with this, perhaps this this first contact with this alien they've never come into to contact with. I can see each successive captain saying, well, Archer did it first. What would Archer have done here? Yeah. How would Archer have gotten through something like this? I can certainly see Captain Pike doing it. Yep. I can maybe see Jim Kirk doing it. Uh, Picard, absolutely. Cisco, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Janeway, hell yeah. Yeah, um, and that's and that's the problem I think, unfortunately, with Enterprise, where it aired in the line of of shows, is we didn't get to see that. We haven't really seen what Archer did in Starfleet and for the Federation because we don't really know what happened after season four with him. There's never really been any discussion. Right. We don't know. We never hear about an Admiral Archer. Uh, we don't know how he died. Well, we do. Of, well, yeah, but but I mean, we we never really we never really seen it. Right. Um. So it's something that it's sad that you know that's kind of some of the things that I hope in Discovery. Of course, we might not see that because it's going to be in thirty one eighty eight this year. But um, <laughs> is that they would have talked about him more. Especially in season one with the beginning of the Klingon War. Well, but at that point, it still would have been... It's been a while. 90 plus years. Yeah, yeah. You know, after the fact. Right. Um, So I I can see where he would have been a distant memory still. Hmm. Um, Hey, they named a a ship after Shran. They could have done something. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, isn't there a... There's a planet Archer 4 at some point in Uh, next gen. Easy pink skin. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, John- Actually, they do talk about uh, – there is a starship, the Archer, in I think it's uh, Nemesis. There Nemesis is. Nemesis or, or, or yeah. Insurrection, one of those. No, it's Nemesis. Okay. Um, Jonathan Archer is is a character I've really grown to love over the years. And I got to say, um, I, I'm, I'm going to be a Scott Bakula apologist because I love the guy. Oh, yeah. I, watching him today in the Star Trek day panels, um, he was just, he was the epitome of class and grace. Everybody on the panel, you know, from Connor Trenier to Linda Park and Anthony Montgomery talked about how Scott really set the tone and he was the top of the call sheet. And he was the guy who shook the hand of every crew member after every day's shooting. Nice. You know, Scott Bakula really kind of, to me, is Jonathan Archer. I can't separate the two the way I can with other mm-hmm. actors in the part. Yeah. Um, the, he's just a class act. And it's good that he was there today. Unfortunately, I've never really seen him at a lot of events or, or conventions or anything like that. And of course, he's got a full time gig right now. He's very popular in Still. NCIS New Orleans. Yeah, I think it's New Orleans. Yeah. Yep. Um. So he's a very busy guy. He's respected in the industry. Um. But to hear something like that that you tell you know you tell the stories that they were talking about today and how wonderful he was with just everybody on the set. It's kind of nice that you can have uh, an actor who kind of is like the character he portrays in a sense when you look at the way that Archer evolves over that, unfortunately, only four seasons. Yeah. NCIS New Orleans uh, about to start its seventh season on CBS, by the way. so he's doing really good compared to Enterprise. (laughs) Well, it's it's, imagine if Enterprise had had seven seasons. Yeah, I know. Um, He's a character whose potential was really cut short. You know, uh, originally Brandon Braga said Archer was going to turn out to be future guy. I would have loved to have seen how that would have played out, Mm -hmm. especially in the the span of the Temporal Cold War. I liked the Temporal Cold War. I liked the whole Sue Laban angle, and I would have loved to see Jonathan Archer really become the man that he was at the end of These Are the Voyages, where he's addressing... 
you know, the Federation Council. Yeah. Um, I would have loved to have seen that transition and that growth. I wish we had seen it, honestly. Yeah, I really do, too. Oh, uh, well, unfortunately, that's what happens when people have Star Trek. What did they call it back then? Star uh, when they were bored of it. Star Trek. Uh, I can't think of the phrase that they used that they used when there was too much Star Trek at the time, which is ridiculous. There is no such thing. Um, <laughs> I, th- I think we had some some Berman burnout, but um, burnout. That's what it was. Star Trek burnout. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think at that point, the franchise needed a rest. And it, yeah, I think it was the best thing that when you look at what we got now, I think it was the best thing that happened. I do, too. Uh, there are a couple more captains we want to talk about mm-hmm. um, in the years since Star Trek Enterprise. Obviously, we've seen some more Star Trek. We have. We have. And we really can't escape a discussion on captains with without talking about the one we really wish we got more time with. And that is the prime universe, Philippa Giorgio. Mm. Um, a character with so much potential, a character I loved yeah. during those first two episodes of Discovery because I really saw the warmth and the humanity in Giorgio. And that's something that I wish that we had gotten to see more of. Absolutely. You know, I love what Michelle Yeoh brings to the role. But she is the mirror universe, Philippa. So it's never going to be the same. Um, and what we saw of Prime Universe was really special. We got a, another small glimpse of that in Short Treks, which I absolutely love. We only yep. she was only on screen for like two minutes, but it was just fantastic. And the the compassion and the understanding and the sense of family, I think that she brought to the Shenzhou was really something that. Um, stood out. Yeah. Even when the, even when we didn't get to see it very much, you got to see in just a short amount of time that it was on screen, how well that crew, res- how much that crew respected her and how much that if you crossed her, you were going to pay for it. Like we saw with Burnham. <laughs> <laughs> Undoubtedly. Um, it's a character that I really feel was, and I understand why it happened. I mean, because mm-hmm. it, it had, it drove the story. Yeah. It, it's a, critical pot, plot point that that this character dies in, in at the end of episode two of Star Trek Discovery. But man, that Philippa Georgia would have been probably uh, a, a revered and, and loved captain in the pantheon of Star Trek. Just that that whole first scene where she's on the bridge, you know, talking about, you know, is this level of <laughs> of sarcasm necessary? No, but I do like it. Um, it. Really such a great line and delivered so well with just a, a hint of of sparkle in the eye. It's like, yeah. This is a captain that I would love to watch, but absolutely. Um, the Discovery has also had a, a few other captains. Um, <laughs> yeah, one from a mirror universe. Yeah, in Gabriel Lorca, mm-hmm. um, we can't really count him among the the captains courageous because he was really hell bent on a cause. He was, but there is an acting captain of the Discovery right now. Goodness gracious, who is incredibly inspiring, and that is, of course, the Kelpian Saru. Yeah. Um, we know that going into season three, he is the acting captain of the Discovery. Mm-hmm. We have no idea what that's going to translate to in season three. Yeah. Uh, we have to hope that he becomes the permanent captain. But you want to talk about a, a captain that inspires and embodies um, bravery and gallantry and, and the best of what Starfleet has to offer. I tell you what, Saru has learned well. He left his whole planet never thinking he'd ever see any of his race again for the rest of his life, including his family. So yeah. take that as you will. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he's successful and he does well in Starfleet and he is respected by everyone who works with him. And we see him grow as a character that I really don't know we've seen growth with any other character based on how his race has been for millennia with their fear. And then what happens when he loses his threat ganglia and becomes that much more more stronger or strong um, as a character? Yeah. And and I think that that flows out to the rest of the crew. Now, when he's first, you know, dealing with the change, as we'll call it, <laughs> the change, change <laughs> Kelpie and menopause. <laughs> yeah, he 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 makes a couple mistakes, and you know, but you know, you do what you do with what you got, and. He learns from it, but oh yeah, I, Saru. Both you and I have had a very special connection with Saru. You more so than I, of course, with mm-hmm. your wonderful article that you wrote uh, for the Star Trek website last year. And Doug Jones is a, a, just a a master master at his craft, and um, 
he's one of those people that you can't you can't ever see the character played by anyone else because he brings so much to that role. That's really it. I mean, Saru has the benefit of having Christopher Pike to learn from just before yeah. he takes the captain's chair. And I think there's a lot of lessons there for Saru to emulate and build on quite quite honestly because I think that's more important than just copying. Um, in fact, uh, in, in season one, you know, Saru is like, you know, what uh, computer, you know, list for me the greatest captains in Starfleet history. And you see a bunch of names on the screen. And one of them is Chris Pike. Yeah. And Saru already knows he's working with greatness mm-hmm. when he greets him in the transporter room in, in season two, episode one. Um, and so not only is there a lot, there could be the potential for a lot of intimidation there, but Saru accepts it and builds on it. And that's pretty courageous. Look at, uh, he's, he's been uh, marked well, because um, look who he had beforehand. He was working with Captain Giorgio. Yeah. So he, he had two great captains to work with, and Lorca. Uh, but uh, as you said, another story for another time. I still hope we get to see Prime Lorca someday, but who knows. Um, yeah, Saru is, um, he's, he's had two great captains to work with and learn from. And that's one of the things I think is so special about Saru is he just doesn't work well with them. He learns from it and he then teaches that to the other people under his command. I think we've seen that a lot, especially with Tilly. Um, So it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, in season three. It will be. You know, these are characters who who have meant the world to us, uh, who have inspired us, who have have, you know, given us adventures that we never thought possible. Um, Of course, it's all based on great writing. And, yeah. and, and character building and all of those things. So, I mean, it, when we talk about these characters and how great they are, we have to tip our hat to the hundreds, literally, yeah. of writers who have written for these characters over the, the almost six decades of Star Trek. Oh, I absolutely agree. You know, we have so many great actors that have played these characters, but they're nothing without the words of the writing staff that create these characters on yeah. paper, uh, all of the backstory, all of the things that go on from episode to episode, and then the people that actually create that magic on screen, whether it be the directors or the the special effects teams. I don't think we give enough credit to the behind-the-scenes folks um, as we should, uh, so I'm glad that we're talking about that now. And But but you're absolutely right. The writers are the, are the real crown jewel of this franchise because without the writers, just another science fiction show. That's really it. I mean, yeah. there's there's a, a kind of a, a fraternity of of writers or sorority, depending on how you look at it, mm-hmm. that have understood what Star Trek is and what Star Trek should be and written toward it um, for 54 years. That's yeah. from day one all the way up until right now. Um, and it's it it's part of the reason we're celebrating this franchise now over half a century later and will continue to right. for September 8th to come. Exactly. And one of the th- one other thing I would add to that is is we have all this new Star Trek right now. And one of the things that I am passionate about with my love for the Star Trek that we're seeing right now with Discovery, with Picard, Lower Decks, later Section 31, later Strange New Worlds, and what are off is coming. These people that are involved in it are as passionate about this franchise as we are. And they get to live their dream of creating what goes on in that universe. And I give them all the credit in the world for what they're doing. I give them all the credit in the world for putting up with the bull crap that people throw at them. And I can't wait to see what comes down the road for the next 54 years that we celebrate this every September 8th. Here, here. Dan, of course, we, we really have to, to take a time out here and do a big thanks to our friends the band Five Year Mission um, they who have a podcast on this here network, which is pretty fantastic, I might add. Five Year Mission, the podcast. I love the name. Huh. Uh, the huh. name is amazing. Huh. But the show is is even better. You know, in their most recent episode, they had a great conversation with Mike and Denise Okuda. Yeah, they did. And man, what a great, great time. It made me incredibly jealous of that get um, because uh, I would have loved to talk to them too. I have to talk to the guy who talks to who books the talent around here. Um, but we want everyone to head on out to fiveyearmission.net, download all their albums, you know, and, or actually, you know what? Order the CDs. Yes. That's even better mm-hmm. because you want that physical media in your hand and you want to support the band. And that honestly is the best way to do it. Spotify is nice, but Spotify doesn't pay artists anything practically. Mm. So get the media, put it in your hands, put the CD player in your car and your stereo at home and listen to all those songs because we guarantee you're going to become a huge fan. That's fiveyearmission.net. Go support that band. 
I just love when we throw all the little bits of music in our podcast. So I just start beep bopping in my seat with my headset on, feel like I'm in the recording studio with the band. No, I don't. Um, no, anyway, don't. no, I don't. You know, I, Bill, let's let's talk about something serious though for for a oh, change. Oh, all right, yeah. yeah. Space Seed, classic episode, right? You'd agree. Is that is that the one where the Botany Bay is under the Enterprise? Exactly. I did not know you were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, we're introduced to Khan, Nooney, and Singh. That we all know. But, but Bill, did you, did you pay close attention to she who would become his wife? I did. You did? Okay. Did yeah. you know that she was one of the finest musical historians in all of Starfleet? Huh? Yeah. Did, she knew who this man was. She knew he played to sold-out concerts all across the world in the 20th century. What? She, Yeah, she knew he was to be feared, but she could not fear him, for she loved him, his power, his music, Bill. Wait, you're making it sound like this is the episode they find Axl Rose. No, 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 no. (laughs) Uh, You know, not all good things happen in this, you know, later on in life. You know, alas, she was, she was one of the 20 who went mad and died because of the dreaded SETI eels. Oh, my word. She was, oh, it's hard to say. I'm getting choked up. Yeah, L- I bet. L- Lieutenant, <laughs> Lieutenant Marla Farkivers. Do you, want, do you want to do a second L- take L- on that? Because L- 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 I'm crying. It's Lieutenant <laughs> yeah, Marla Farkivers uh, from Space Seed. She was and will always will be his beloved wife. <laughs> yeah, let's pour one out for Marla Farkivers. <laughs> pour one out. <laughs> That's um, good. Uh, yeah, I I didn't know Khan was so musical. I thought you really were describing Axl Rose. No, quite he's, honestly, yeah, very musical. Um, he was music to my ears. Leave me then. I just love that. Go or stay, but do <laughs> because, it because it is what you wish to do. Oh yeah, love that line. That's a beautiful line. <laughs> and that's f- ten times better than the Farkism at Dangerous Road. Five Year Mission dot net. Please. Get all that music. You're going to love it, we swear. Uh, of course, don't forget, you too can support the... Pa- <laughs> I got Dan Brain going on right now. Don't forget that you too can support the Trek Geeks Podcast Network by subscribing to bonus content on Patreon, where you can get all kinds of exclusive perks like laptop decals and t-shirts and our unparalleled annual supporters pin, which we produce with our friends at Fansets every year, Dan. Absolutely. It's gorgeous. I got it sitting right here. This just looks great. Uh, we also want to take a moment to thank our associate producers for Trek Geeks. We are so grateful for their support. And they are Dave Andrews, Vikram Bhatt, Luke Burnham, Brad DeMag, William Edward M. Jr., Brandon Everidge, Andy Fark, Kimberly Francis, Jonathan Hamilton, Brooke Horton, Ryan Jeffs, John Krikorian, Sean Lynn, Rick Mason, Jamie McGregor, Aaron Molenkoff, Shane Murray, Tim Robertson, Greg Rozier, Eric Sakian, Adam Sanders, Tim Serdar, Heather Sohn, Lisa Tomlinson, Jessica Dax Vincent, Trey Womack, Ron Robel, and the gracious and wonderful Conrad Hutchins. Whoa, you had another octave there. That's pretty good. <laughs> we also want to thank our Trek Geeks producers for their support. They are Mike Bovia, Chaz Bradshaw, Ken Bird, Kyle Castillo, Peter Craig, Rachel Delaney, Craig Ewing, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Kimberly Hartman, David Hood, Steph Lescu, Leonel Marchand, Matt McGonigal, Jim McMahon, Charlie Mulvey, Sean O'Halloran, Jamie Rogers, Casey Shafsky, Chris Trebuzio, Ken Tripp, Christina Werther, and the lovely and talented Jess Vashon. You too can become a producer on the Trek Geeks Network, and it is so easy to do. Head on over to patreon.com slash trekgeeks for all the details. Dan, next week, it's your birthday. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I have a very special gift for you. Yeah, as Dr. McCoy would say when he gets assigned the task of building a whale tank, oh, joy. I am just so excited for this. But, you know, the fans want what the fans want. So next week, it will be the ultimate test of knowledge. Will I be crowned the champion of the universe, or will I join the folks over at Discovering Trek Lower Deck? Deck? Danks? Lower Danks. Lower Danks. Yeah. Lower Danks. As a member of the Waste Extraction Team. Wait a minute. I I already am that. I'm I'm very confused. And that doesn't bode well because next week it's Stump the Geek Infinity on Trek Geeks, the flagship of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Now, so you no have idea. no idea what Stump the Geek Infinity involves. I will no. tell you now, it's going to take Stump the Geek and turn it on its ear. 
Is it a coloring competition? No, not okay. remotely. However, the rules go out the window. Uh, oh. And there are no rules in Stump the Geek Infinity. Okay. I promise you it will not be 10 questions of planet names. <laughs> <laughs> and I can look on my computer for the answers because there's no rules. No, that, that, that's, that's <laughs> so never been really part of the rules. So we just mentioned rule. that ah. you have to use your brain because <laughs> otherwise we're not stumping the geek. Uh, I could spell it wrong because I'm apt to do that. Well, I would like to point out that your track record on Stump the Geek is pretty amazing, even when you think you're going to stink the joint up. All right. Well, we'll see. That's Stump the Geek Infinity next week on Trek Geeks. For more great Star Trek discussion, please check out the other member podcasts of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. In addition to Rewind and Polytrex and Five Year Mission, you can hear the brand new Infinite Trek with Aaron Harvey and Brandy Jackala every Tuesday. And you can find all our podcasts, including where to listen, by visiting trekgeeks.com slash listen. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network, no one talks Trek like we do. And of course, for all the news on all the Star Treks, yo, please visit our great friends at treknews.net and check your podcast app later in the week for more news. For now, this has been episode number 231 of the Trek Geeks Podcast. We do hope you all live long and prosper. Oh, is it me? Sorry. Coconut. Yeah. <laughs> you, you get a week off and you don't even remember to do coconut? What the hell's going on? Music for Trek Geeks is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Trek Geeks is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Ready? Always. <laughs> <laughs> Begin ignition sequence. Twenty. Oh God. Nineteen. No, I remember. Eighteen. What? Where is 17, it? What? Sixteen. We can't lift off without 15, it. Jordy, we've got to abort. 14, no, no, 30, wait, I found it. Twelve. Eleven. Ten. Nine. Eight. Let's seven, rock and roll. Six. Welcome to Deep Space Pride, a gay Star Trek podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Thurlow, and with me is my co-host, Johnson Lee. Hey, Mike. How are you doing Hey, today? Johnson. I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Great. Well, here we are. We are recording episode zero. This is our introduction to the world, all about uh, Deep Space Pride. Um, this is pretty exciting. We've been doing this for a while. Yeah, actually, we've been doing this for four, five months, four oh, and a half months. Four, four and a half. We started yeah. in March, right? Yeah, we started in March. Yes, yeah. March 2020, for those of you who might be listening in the future sometime, uh, right after, about two weeks after we, we meaning the most of the country, but we in New York City went into lockdown. Um, yeah, and we basically decided that we needed to do something productive with our time. Right, so exactly. Why uh, not start a podcast? Why not, right? Um, so yeah, four, four plus months ago, we started and here we are. We are now, um, now it's official. Now it's been announced. Now it's out there to the world. And here we are talking about it and telling Yeah, it, and we've actually it. recorded already a dozen episodes and we finally decided that it was time to do our intro episode. 
so that people can hear about who we are and what we're here to do. Right, exactly. So we are coming to you live slash recorded from New York City, right? Um, yes. And we're recording this on August 4th. So just a couple of days before uh, the latest Star Trek series, Lower Decks premieres, which is really exciting. So this will be out in time for new watchers of Lower Decks to hopefully find us. And, and we'll uh, be in the midst of, as CBS All Access is telling you, 23 weeks of Star Trek, which will take us through the end of the year, which is insane. But also extremely exciting because if this year doesn't need a smash bang up, really exciting ending, I don't know what does. Oh, so, so basically you're saying that the Discovery season three finale better deliver, otherwise it's over. I mean, that, that, is a, <laughs> that is a strong opinion, but yes, I would love, uh, because you know what, it'll probably be at least a year and a half before we see them again. Oh, who so... knows? Or like, who knows when we're going to get more Star Trek after Discovery season three. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. With all the, the shutdowns. But we do know that there are some exciting things coming out. Uh, Star Trek Prodigy and Nickelodeon kids animated Star Trek series will be launching in 2021. Um, Strange New Worlds mm -hmm. uh, will be hopefully recording in 2021 <laughs> uh, so yes. that they can uh, maybe be released by a year from now or the end of the year. Of, yeah, uh, I'm hoping that end of 2021 we can see Strange, Strange New, Worlds. New Worlds. Yeah, that yeah. would be great. Um, but I mean, they are really setting it up for setting us all up for year round Star Trek once all of these series kind of get going and also when the world kind of reopens, right? Yeah. Um, but I have been seeing on some social media that some TV shows and some productions have started opening up. Nothing that I really can remember from a naming standpoint, but I think places are starting to gear up. Um, yeah, I think it's more from what I read, it's a little bit more like some like some international territories are starting to film. Yeah. Um, so Netflix, for example, is like, you know, getting on that bandwagon and filming internationally because they've opened up versus LA, which is like basically going back into lockdown. Right. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, Toronto. Yeah. So Toronto is definitely opening up for some recording. I think I've seen a little bit of yeah, that. Because Can Canada's fine. Yeah. Well, the yeah. other thing too, though, is, uh, you know, the American actors are going to have trouble getting into Canada. Oh, that's true. So I don't Another know. Another hurdle. So yeah, all these hurdles to uh, to eventually in the future having a year round Star Trek to talk mm -hmm. about, which will keep us podcasters uh, busy. Yeah, totally. Plus so, the seven hundred and fifty hours of uh, Star Trek that's already been recorded. So. Um, so Mike, do you want to tell our listeners a little about who we are and what we're doing here? Yeah. Um, you can start first. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. Yes. Uh, well, let, let's start with why we're here. Um, and you know, I approached you, um, back, I think before we actually started recording, cause it took us one, uh, a little bit of time to get, to get, get this together, but also mm -hmm. two, you know, you had to think about it and, um, yes. And so originally the genesis of this idea was for me that, you know, I listened to a few Star Trek podcasts and I really enjoy them. Obviously, um, we're on the Trek Geeks Network, uh, podcast network, so which we're really excited about. Um, but so they were my entry into Star Trek fandom as far as at least having a, an outlet for um, watching an episode of Discovery and then listening to Discovering Trek where Bill and Dan mm -hmm. would break down the episode. And I remember reaching and out And I to, didn't even know about Trek Geeks until right. you told me about them. Because, right. you know, we didn't listen to the same podcast. I actually started um, listening to Transfer Room 3, which is another completely different Star Trek podcast, which has been off of IGN. Um, and I've been listening to that one for a few years. And then you told me about Trek Geeks 
only in the past couple of months when you had started to approach Bill and Dan about just getting some advice. And I was like, yeah. oh, what's this? Another Star Trek podcast to act my cue. So there it is. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. But we were both listening to different, obviously different podcasts. And we both enjoy what we listen to. But for me, at least, there was something missing. And I think that was a voice from an LGBTQIA perspective where um, where we could talk about Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's originally why I approached you about that. And also because uh, we had, we've met about a year ago. We were introduced through my boyfriend, a good friend of yours. Um, mm-hmm. And that's how this friendship and talking about Star Trek began. So uh, we we got to go through Star Trek Picard and talk about it through text, mostly with the occasional conversations in person um, about the series. And uh, it was really cool to be able to do that. And, you know, I know for, for you, I was one of the first gay geeks who liked Star Trek. And yeah. For me, you were um, the one that I talked to about it the most, um, but I had only recently, prior to me, me really meeting you, found mm-hmm. out that some of my other friends were also Star Trek fans. So um, that was also something that was really important to me is to put our voices out there so mm-hmm. that people like us, part of the LGBTQIA community, can... Um, find community with other gay geeks or you know lgbt Mm -hmm. q uh geeks and um i think that that was really important to put that voice out there and to share our perspective obviously it's been an exciting couple of years for us we've gotten uh, a gay couple on star trek discovery Mm -hmm. which was amazing and um certainly gave us all hope for the future um (laughs) And then uh, towards the end of Picard, we are all picking up on some unusual vibes or between which, Rafi and Seven. Which I have so. notes for, which I definitely have thoughts on, which <laughs> yes. we do explore in our Picard podcast episode. Right. Um, but yes, do continue. Yeah. So, um, so it's a great time. We're seeing more representation in sci-fi. Uh, which is great in a lot of respects. And um, so I think it was time to contribute to the voices out there talking about it. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we're, you know, my ideal, um, my idea or ideal behind all of this was reaching those people who don't, who may feel alone, uh, may feel are part of the LGBTQ community and who don't, really have other people to talk to Star Trek about. And so right, we right. want to be those people that you talk to Star Trek about or you listen to us talk about it and you interact mm-hmm. with us through various modes and of communication. And um, possibly eventually in the future, we'll be able to meet people in person um, at future events, possibly. Or two fans. What's maybe that? Maybe three fans. I said maybe <laughs> yes. two or three fans. I think we might have a We'll be in Vegas, like, oh, hey, I see you. Thanks yes. for listening. <laughs> One of three. One of three people. Well, we'll have yeah. a small meetup and just enjoy it. Um, <laughs> but I think that that was really important. So that's why yeah. we're here. We're here to contribute our voices to mm-hmm. those people talking about Star Trek. And we've got a lot of Star Trek to watch. We've obviously uh, enjoy talking about it, just the two of us. So we hope you'll be able to experience that as a genuine enthusiasm uh we are excited and we um we want to share that excitement and we want to hear your excitement as well so Mm -hmm. that was a little bit about the genesis of this whole podcast yeah and you know just to reiterate what you're saying um you know i think that when you first came to me and as you mentioned i had to think about a little bit because i'm not usually the one even though i work in marketing i'm not usually one to put myself out there um you know even on twitter i'm very inactive because honestly you know like sometimes like especially in these kind of social media environments things can get so toxic and combative um i have opinions but i don't need to put my opinion out there and then for my ass to essentially get handed to me in some weird fashion in a way that I'm not even looking for. So, you know, I'm usually very reluctant to like put myself out there digitally, unless it's something that's very casual, very frivolous. Um, So when you came to me, 
with this idea. I did have to think about it a little bit. Um, I obviously love Star Trek and I have a lot of thoughts and opinions about it, as you know. Um, but for me to then put that into a format for people to consume and listen to, that was something that I had to really think about. And ultimately what you're saying in regard to the diversity element, um, you know, like you are definitely the first gay Star Trek fan I've really ever met, to be honest. And I've met even, even I would say like the Star Trek fans I've met organically have been very limited. Um, and most of them are pretty casual viewers. Like they'll have seen like a few episodes here and there versus someone that has read the Star Trek Next Generation Techno Manual. You know, like that's another level of fandom that is niche. Um, and I feel that that's kind of the, those are kind of the Star Trek fans that you and I are. Um, yes. But then to add to another circle and then then diagram is this LGBTQ IA plus element, um, which is even more niche. Um, and I thought that we had just based upon the intersection of our interests and our, of our backgrounds, something unique to contribute to the conversation. So I was like, okay, you know, I can buy into this. Um, I think that we can bring a unique perspective to the conversation. And look, that doesn't necessarily mean that every single episode we're going to be like, what is the perspective of a LGBTQIA plus person, you know, on this episode? It's not so much that. I think that ultimately we are just fans enjoying Star Trek and we're here to talk about Star Trek. And once in a while there is going to be that kind of angle and that kind of lens that we're going to discuss things through. But, you know, like I think that even kind of just having that kind of different perspective and having that different kind of voice, even if at the end of the day, there's only so much, so many things that we can say about Encounter at Farpoint because there's only so many things you can say about Encounter at Farpoint. Um, you know, like I think that it's still bringing a little bit more diversity to the mix. And ultimately, as you're saying, Mike, that's what we're here to do. There we go. So why don't you tell people a little bit about what to expect from our episodes? Yeah, so essentially our episodes have evolved a great deal from when we first started them in March. And the first episode that we're going to release is actually when we, around when we decided to start, or start this podcast. So we are going to be doing um, an episode on the finale of Star Trek Picard, and also another episode that's looking at season one of Picard as a whole. And then we get into the group of things, and every episode is going to have a very basic layout and structure. Um, at, the cent at the center of each episode, it, we're going to be talking about one episode of Star Trek that we've decided to watch, and sometimes that could be you know, when the Lower Decks starts up, that's going to be an episode of Lower Decks, but we're also going to be peppering in potentially some other episodes that we decided to watch here and there, or we were inspired to watch because of whatever reason. Um, but that is going to be at the center of each episode, and we would love for all our listeners, all three of you, to follow along, to watch the episode, and then to hear us banter about it. Uh, but besides talking about the episode, we're also going to talk a little bit about what other things we're Star Trekking whether that be a news item that we're excited about, another new series that CBS All Access decides to launch, anything along those lines. Um, Mike, you and I both read Star Trek novels. Well, you listen to Star Trek novels. I read I Star Trek novels. Them. Right, yeah. So, you know, there might be a little bit of that. Sometimes we'll just turn on Hulu or Netflix or Amazon Prime and we'll just decide to rewatch a movie like you rewatched the motion picture recently. Right, um, exactly. I recently rewatched Star Trek Six on Discover Country recently, just because it was my 40th time, and I just had to watch it again. Um, and you so, also just finished the whole rewatch of Deep, Deep Space Nine. So that is true from yes, beginning to I, end. So I watched, I rewatched all of DS Nine. For those of you viewers, viewers, listeners that are interested to know, I was like, "Huh, it's been so long. It's been literally." over 20 years since I have seen DS9. So why don't I watch it again? And I rewatched the whole thing from start to finish in three months. Um, I did 
skip over or fast forward the Vic Fontaine episodes because I can't. <laughs> um, but, you know, other than that, I, I watched every single episode, yes. And this is a whole other episode of podcast, but then I watched the What We Left Behind documentary, and right. that was oh, great. Yeah, that yeah was exactly. That's a nice um, cap on watching that whole season. So yeah, no, it was like... Well, I watched it like a week after I finished all seven seasons of DS9. So it was very fresh in my mind. So when they were talking about this moment or that moment, I was like, I know what you're talking about because I just watched it two weeks ago. So, yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah. yeah. And actually, I supported that on that uh, oh, the Kickstarter. documentary the Kickstarter? on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Probably Kickstarter, most likely. Yeah, I don't remember which one they used. So I got, a, I got to watch it, stream it early when it first uh, premiered, which was yeah. nice. Um, but I haven't watched it since then. So It was so good. So yeah, good. it was great. Um, so anyway, so yes, we'll talk about what we Star Trek for the week. We're talking our, our uh, episodic, um, focused... Um, commentary will be called spilling the trek um that's that segment then we'll go then we usually go into a little bit of off topic so what other sci-fi fantasy i i'm also a gamer so we'll talk about some like random off topic stuff that we're doing or consuming um and then finally we talk a little bit our, about ourselves and how we're each doing personally in our personal lives whether that is our relationships dating life, whatever. And that segment is called Dishing with Deanna. So obviously, you know, we want to go to Counselor Troy's office and share our feelings and share what's going on in our lives. There we go. So, and, and she she's a great listener. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and she so yeah. and she knows if we're lying. So and there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, and also since you talked about Deep Space Nine, uh, you know, I think both of our favorite series is Deep Space Nine, but the genesis of this podcast really started with Picard. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, what we decided to do is we we watched the, end, obviously we watched season one of Picard together, but then we went back and, you know, the when we were recording these as episodes we picked to talk about in Spilling the Trek, we kind of went through, we went back to the beginning. Well, the beginning for me, the not so beginning for you. And, and to further explain that, I, um, but well, first and foremost, we're both next generation fans. Mm -hmm. We grew up with that. That is, that is our first, um, first new series that was, we got to see live aired on TV. Um, now I started, I started, I got to see Encounter at Farpoint from the start um, but I was a Star Trek fan before that because uh, growing up, my family would go up to my grandmother's on the weekends and Friday night dinner would be uh, myself and my uncle John in the living room uh, at my Nana's house having dinner and watching Star Trek. So uh, he is responsible for getting me into Star Trek uh, back then. But that was obviously reruns of the original series, which I really, I did enjoy. And that started my fandom and started my book collecting. I collected all of the pocket books for a really long time. Um, I have so many of those pocket books. They're like, yeah, I know. I, I piles of them at my parents' house. Yeah. Mine are in storage as well. Um, so those were great. You know, that was kind of, that was before Star Trek was really in comics again. Oh, there actually, I take that back. There was always so, I think DC put out a Star Trek comic for a yeah, while. Yeah, they had like a few like random like crossovers with like X Men or something, right? Like yeah, well, I think that was part of it. Then, but they also had an ongoing Star Trek series and then an ongoing Star Trek Next Generation series. So I did collect those oh, comics I didn't as well. Even, I've never even oh, read yeah. those. Yeah, oh. I will. Uh, How about uh, that? I mean, the artwork is uh, leaves a lot to be desired and I'm is sure. not up to standards of what today's comic books are. But mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of where my fandom started. But I get to see Star Trek from the beginning. You, on the other hand, joined Next Generation uh, in and actually three. in season three. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, I started a little bit later and then I watched... I was able to watch some of the older episodes when they did reruns, or I actually bought them on VHS. And it was outrageous. It was like one VHS tape for one episode was like $15. It was like outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. 
but that was like 1495 i think the longer two-part episodes were like 1999 yeah it was like crazy yeah yeah um but eventually i i went back but you know, I ba- I basically started at the what I would consider the golden age of TNG when mm-hmm. you know things really got into a groove. So then going back to Encounter at Far Point was admittedly difficult, yes. um, but still critical viewing. You, you know? can you came on uh, when they had real uniforms, and I watched when they wore the spandex and the. Uh... It just looks so uncomfortable. Yeah, um, yeah. and, and apparently I... it was giving the crew like back problems. Oh wow! Yeah, you, yeah, that was like I part of the issue. That, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I also uh, that's funny that reminded me uh, suddenly. I did also collect the Star Trek: The Next Generation magazine, so um, which came out every couple of months, I would say, and covered a certain number of episodes. Um, so I had that collection for a, a while. Uh, that so did you ever c- collect Communicator, or was that? What did you no, just so you? Communicator was uh, you had to pay for a subscription, right? Because yeah, yeah, it was like of part of the Star Trek fan club, and I never joined the official Star Trek fan club. Wait, so was I part of the Star Trek fan club? Yeah, I don't remember I, that. I remember I, paying for the magazine. I don't remember subscribing. Yeah, to I mean, that, the, eventually it finally was on sale at like at Barnes and Noble or Borders, Borders. or whatever. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure like that, that was an exclusive to the fan club for a while. So I never mm-hmm. really did that. Um, but was, I would go in a great magazine. I loved yeah, it, it was, uh, I oh, treasured well. those. Uh, and I treasured the next generation and then the deep space nine magazines. I don't remember yeah. collecting the Voyager ones, but uh, that was, I was much I mean, older. You're not even a big Voyager fan. I am not a big Voyager fan. It's a, it's a fine, perfectly fine. It's Star Trek, and I still like it. I just it's not my favorite. It has its ups and downs. It does have its ups and downs. I do like some yeah. of the characters and less, you know. I th- but I think that's part of also this. Like, we have very differing opinions on characters and mm-hmm. things uh, and and series, but and we I imagine that our listeners do as well. So it's always fun to kind of debate these things uh with someone else who cares as much about star trek as you and Mm -hmm. i do so that's sort of the fun of it and so yeah so after we after we did watch uh season one of picard together uh and talk about it we went back to the beginning and we did an episode on uh far point station on um I can't even think of the episode now. Farpoint Station. Encounter at Farpoint? Encounter at Farpoint. Thank you. Wow. You wow. had like a brain freeze. Or I did have brain a brain fart, freeze. Brain fart, yes. brain freeze. Brain fart. Uh, brain, brain fart there. Yes. And yeah. so uh, we'll kind of take you through seasons one and two um, with some episodes, which we'll probably release as bonus episodes because with 23 weeks of new Trek coming mm-hmm. out, uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about. And uh, so we'll probably go back and release some of these as uh, as historical documents um, <laughs> of archives. our time in uh, in coronavirus lockdown, so mm-hmm. um, look forward to those. And and that's really the evolution of our podcast. And it got us to the point where, when I reached out to Bill and Dan, they were th- for mentoring. I just wanted to ask them some questions about podcasting and get some advice on a few things that we were talking about. And uh, I so I had a video. I had a Zoom call with bill and um he didn't have a lot of feedback for me the the feedback ended up i'm sure being he had like, like mental notes but he was trying to be nice maybe uh, i mean he you know he he said we had a good foundation and uh we'd like you to join our network and i was like what you were like uh, what and i uh, was like what that's because yeah. i barely knew who they yeah, were yeah you didn't know who they were like, oh, um, that's that's great but what who? what does that mean what does that mean um yeah. yeah, I mean, no. I I was utterly speechless at that, uh, and I'm sure uh, Bill remembers that. And that was a, a Tuesday night in July. And, okay, uh, remember it down to the to the minute as well. Uh, it, I think we had a call at eight o'clock at night. Yeah. All so, right. um, and it was after my vacation to the Finger Lakes with Dennis. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I can probably pinpoint very quickly when this call happened so. well i remember getting the text from you and you were very excited i was like oh cool i was i was well i was a text saying i'm so excited can i call you 
So oh, and you're right. like, that's right. It was a call. Like, I, it's all hazy to me. Yeah. So, yeah. but so yeah. So now we're on this new adventure, but we've got uh, some great episodes that cover uh, Next Generation season one and two. Some some key episodes through that mm-hmm. um, that really play into what you know led to Picard the series. Yeah. Uh, and then we also sprinkled in a couple of episodes on, uh, well, we jumped ahead to season seven when Lower Decks was announced. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we watched the Lower Decks episode of Next Generation. And then we also, uh, at the beginning of June, we decided to pick up uh, Deep Space Nine Far Beyond the Stars because of everything that was kind of going on in the world. Um, with all of the uh, protests uh, oh. in the United States. So there, so there is a rhyme and reason to how we picked the episodes. Right. If you were to look at the list and you and you don't have the context, and I'm like, what's happening? But there is, there is a rhyme and reason to everything that we selected. So. Yes, there is. So that's, a, yeah. So that's kind of the evolution of our podcast. And, you know, a little bit about us as gay geeks who love to talk about this stuff. Uh, we really are excited about all of this. And part of that excitement is that hopefully we get to talk to people like us who are looking for fan, you know, fellow fans to discuss Star Trek. And uh, we hope that you'll, you'll reach out to us and let us know what you think of, uh, think of our brand spanking new shiny podcast. Uh, This is a journey. So we do not expect the, um, we please do not we don't expect, expect all the feedback to be positive is that what you're saying uh yes i mean we expect there to be some constructive, constructive feedback, feedback presented in a positive positive way manner. positive spin yes um and we're happy to hear that because we do want to get better we do want to give um give the fans what they want but we love talking about star trek and uh so we're excited to see how this progresses and ev- uh, evolves and um yeah so that's uh that's a little bit about us and uh we'll, and yeah we'll def- so if you guys want to you know give us constructive feedback or follow along with us we are on social media on instagram and twitter handles are at deep space pride and you can also email us at deep space pride at gmail.com uh we Cannot guarantee that we will respond to every email. Um, you know, the emails we'll do our best. Three of you, but um, yeah, you know, we (laughs) will do our best. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so yeah, we we hope that you'll come along on this journey with us and explore uh, Star Trek from an LGBTQIA perspective, um, but also to fans who love to geek out about this stuff. And we could go on and on. In fact, right before we started recording this, we were already geeking out about the music of Star Trek. So, uh, and the intro sequences. So debating, we will debating the intro sequences. We were debating that. Yeah. Series. So uh, we we have that as a future idea for an episode. So we'll we'll probably release that in the future. Um, but we, you know, if you have other ideas about uh, what we should talk about, episodes or um, key episodes that you really love, then send them to us and maybe we'll be able to fit them into the schedule. Uh, But we're excited. No promises. (laughs) No promises. But we we hope that you'll come along on this journey with us. And uh, yeah, we look forward to talking to you in the next podcast. Yep. Bye, everyone. Deep Space Pride is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.